Book Group with Mary. Through the Mists by Robert James Lees. This is Chapter 12, Session 2. 17th of October, 2012, Wondai, Queensland, Australia. Anyway, okay. <laughs> Hi everyone, welcome to part two of chapter 12, the short chapter that's taking us a long time to move through. <laughs> who was here last week? Or who, yeah, who wasn't here last week? Oh, there's a fair few of you actually, yeah. Last week we had a few hiccups. Um, everyone felt a little bit challenged, or a lot of people seemed to feel challenged by the chapter, and I felt like because of some fear that the chapter brought up, um, there was a desire to have the group go in a direction that wasn't so scary, rather than the direction I wanted to take it in, which was to confront the fear. So um, this week, I'd like to spend a fair bit of time talking about the homework, but hopefully those who weren't here will be able to catch on, because before I do that, I'm going to just mainly well, for a couple of purposes, I'm going to run through what I saw in the chapter. Rather than, we've been using this Q&A kind of style, which I really enjoy, but I thought it could be just beneficial, just because it's such a fraught kind of a chapter, to just run through what I saw. And please ask questions or make comments as you feel you relate to them as I go through. Before I do that, I think um, I just wanted to mention I suppose what I, my desire for this group, my desire for this group is that just that I'm able to create a space um, just through my intention being here where all of us can grow. And when we want to go into an addiction in a group, it immediately locks up the space for growth for everyone. For if I'm in addiction with you guys, it's very hard for you guys to grow unless you actively go, I'm not handling that addiction from Mary and I'm going to just feel through it. And equally, when all of us get into a space where we go, this book group's pretty comfy, I kind of like it, it's pleasant and uh, it's fun and we have to talk about stuff that's really interesting, but I don't really want to go to the fear zone. <laughs> Immediately that we start avoiding fear, we create addictions. So um, last week, I feel because this chapter is very much about the truth about the, the soul condition, the collective soul condition on earth, the truth about spirit interactions, and there is some large truths that we struggled to kind of get to last week about how interaction between spirits and the earth actually happens, the laws that govern that, and the emotions that govern that. So when we get to a space where we go, yeah, I don't really want to deal with the kind of confronting stuff, it kind of feels blare because immediately growth is kind of shut down for, for all of us, I feel, you know. So that's my intention for the group. Um, and I try to look at that myself very sincerely. So every time I walk out of here, or, and while I'm up here, I'm thinking, how am I, you know, creating a space for growth? How am I honouring truth, honouring God's truth, honouring myself, honouring you guys? Because when I do that, then, then there's a clearer space. When either one of you or one of me <laughs> decides to abandon that, it gets pretty shaky pretty quick. Last week I felt that I was quite direct with you guys because I could feel it happening and I knew it was a line I didn't want to cross anymore. But then I felt a lot of you rather than choosing the humble route, get a bit confronted and a bit, heels were dug in emotionally a bit. And for me, looking back, I wish at that point I'd just said, let's go home. <laughs> you know, that probably would have been the most effective way of showing this is, we're not coming at this space from this, we're not coming at this lesson from the same space. But, you know, I learned through that as well. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'll just have a drink and we'll get back to the chapter. Okay, so this morning I just typed up the notes I had made from the chapter, and some of this we covered briefly last week, but I thought it's great to just have a sort of a, an overview of everything that's pointed out here, because really I think it's only four pages, but there's quite a lot. 
Did anyone feel that they went back to it during the week or went back to what we talked about and saw more? For those of you, yeah, a few of you, yeah. Okay, so the first, the first truth, I suppose, or the first, yeah, the first truth that's highlighted in the chapter, which is something that Raj brought up, it's in the very first paragraph of the, of the chapter, when Fred realises something about travel. And we talked about this last week in terms of how travel occurs in the spirit world. Okay. And we said it was governed by one thing. Does anyone remember what it, what it was? Yep, uh, Glenda, if you pass the mic across. Who's got the mic on that side? It's governed by our desire to learn. Uh, yeah, it's governed by desire. Can we say desire? Because remember we saw Marie governed by her desire to avoid and that caused her to be drawn back to the earth plane very rapidly and quickly, didn't it? So we said it was governed by desire, but there were issues about whether there was a lesson or a teaching involved that might change the way that we travel. It might not happen instantaneously, it might happen if, for in the case of this chapter, Krishna wants to show Fred how, how it looks as you cross the mists and different things that happen. So, so everything is governed by desire and can we say love? And within that, there can be opportu the, the opportunities for teaching are shown. So everyone follow that? That's just one of the basic things we saw in the beginning. Then Kushner talks to Fred about two major ideas that, about death that pervade the earth and life after death. Can anyone remember what they were? Yvonne? Um, one was the, um, the world view that the physical is more powerful than the spirit world and the feeling that when we pass or when we die, we lose all the power to do, to do everything. Yes. And he says, it's on page 143 of this book, he says that people often believe work, progress and development cease at death. And what was the other idea? So one is when you're dead, that's it. I'm just gonna put that's it. And what was the other major idea he talked about that pervades the earth, Ange? Um, that spirit communication was stopped at some point. Yeah, um, and the Christian belief of if there's spirit communication now, it's from where? The devil. The devil, yeah. So that's it or it's the devil? <laughs> that's a very kind of broad brushstroke summary. That's right. And why did he talk about those two truths with Fred? What was, what was he trying to say to him? Yeah, Ange? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, he was, I think he was trying to illustrate um, the two greatest um, barriers or problems with um, the whole spirit world. The, the, the perception of the spirit world, um, our awareness of the spirit world. Yeah, yeah. Aware, I feel like he was trying to say these two issues prevent clear and open communication yeah, between the spirit world and earth. Yeah. These are the two major things that block it. If you just pass the mic forward, yeah. And that's because um, Fred is quite insistent that he really wants to go back now and tell everybody. Yes, that's right. So Kushner is also teaching him about patience, isn't he? And one of the themes in the chapter is if you have knowledge and if you, you, you're going to need to gain knowledge and patience in order to grow, in order to en do any great endeavour, he says that later on, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah, very true. Okay, and so based on that, he said, okay, either on earth people go, that's it, you're dead, you're dead, or generally the other major idea is if you're hearing spirits, it's from the devil. And we were just talking earlier about how these days it means you're mad. So those two things block the communication. And then I said something as a general rule last week, does anyone 
remember what it was about beliefs. I felt this was a demonstration of how Suzanne... That belief was essentially emotional. It was emotional, absolutely. Yeah. And what does, it, what does it do to us when we have an erroneous belief? Well, it kind of it, it shapes our personality and who we are, who we communicate, who we attract into our life. Yes, so it's sort yes. of like the cornerstone of the law of rapport, perhaps. Or? Yes, yeah. it's very true. I'm looking for one more thing. If you just pass ahead in front of you to Kel, yeah. It blinds us. Yes, our error-based beliefs can make us blind. Well, they do make us blind, but beliefs can make us blind. So all of us are blocked to the spirit world largely because we have certain beliefs about it. And we talked, Kushner is talking to Fred about these beliefs that we just mentioned, but we talked last week as well about the fear-based beliefs that we have, that spirits will be able to hurt me more if I can see them and hear them, or if, if I see them and hear them, I will be mad. Or all of these kind of beliefs shut us down from the spirit world. And I, I further led the analogy into other areas of our life and part of your homework focused on that was, what are the other beliefs in your life that have made you blind to issues of love? Barbara? Sorry, I wasn't gonna answer that question, Mary, that you just said, but while That's you were right. talking, I, I remembered that um, last week we also spoke about um, the error in our belief that um, um, God spoke only in the old times and therefore um, our area in our belief there that God's not there for us anymore and he doesn't speak to us anymore. Yes, yeah. that angelic and, revelation yes. can't happen anymore. Yeah. yeah. So that was another part of the, the lessons because really after this point, Kushner goes on to outline, I've listed eight lessons he gives Fred in the next few pages. Um, and one of them is that he, he teaches him that Christian beliefs are flawed because of the inconsistency between the Bible revelation and the current situation, that he says God is unchangeable, so then how can they say that God has changed on the issue of angelic communications? He's saying it's not logical. What if anyone applied logic to this theory, they'd see that there's a problem. Yeah, so that's one of the lessons. Does anyone, can anyone remember or think of any of the other lessons that he, he gives him? He basically refutes the two major beliefs um, that death is the end and that Christian belief that communication is with the afterlife is work of the devil. So he refutes it through that point that I just said about the Christianity. But before that, he refutes the first, the first thing. Ange, do you? Um, are you referring to the, um, the discrepancy between we all understand that the, the brain is not the mind? Yes. Yeah. 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 So what's he basically trying to say there to Fred? That there's a huge gulf between um, our understanding. We can see that the brain is not the mind, but we're not prepared to go, well, what is the mind? Yes. You know, the mind must be connected to something that... Yeah, exactly. Greater... He says this beautiful quote, which is on page... At the bottom of page 43, 143. In the first instance, the brain is not the mind but simply the convenient instrument by which it operates under certain circumstances. Now, we all understand this, don't we? Because we've seen AJ draw on the board like a million times the, um, the physical body. My stick figures always have their arms up. I don't know why. <laughs> anyway, so he talks about the physical body and the spirit body and the brain being in our physical body and the mind being in our spirit body. And then, of course, the soul being the actual receptacle of our life's experiences. But these two are instruments for us to interpret it. Yeah, so here he points out that just because the, mind, the brain and the mind disconnect, it's not really logical to say then, to make the leap that the mind actually ceases to exist because we can't know. So he's also trying to bring logic to this flawed belief that makes people blind on earth. Thank you, Ant. Yeah. Okay, that's the first two lessons. Beyond that, can anyone think of any of the other ones? Remember any of the other ones that he points out? Lorraine? Um, 
because of the different standpoints, um, either side can't see each other? Yes. And do you remember what we talked about? Uh, could you explain that a little bit more? So what's it like if I'm in a spirit form? I'm in the spirit form. Um, the spirit world is more tangible to me. Yes. And um, the experiences that I have, I think the senses are heightened and everything. Yes. So when you get to the earth, everything seems grey and murky. Yeah. And yeah, is that enough? Or did you yeah. And when so depending on where I am, if I'm in the spirit form, then the spirit world is the most tangible thing to me. When I'm in the physical form, then the physical world is the most tangible to me. Now, obviously, partly that's because of our beliefs, and he talks about the point of resistance. When I'm in the physical form, there's a point of resistance to understanding the spirit form because I haven't been in it. When I'm in the spirit form, if I have some false beliefs and errors, there's a resistance to how the physical world should be now. And so he talks about because the point of resistance is different for either party, it causes the other side to be murky. Yeah. And this is again where this theme of if, if we correct our beliefs, a lot more clarity comes, is highlighted. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That was, yeah. Any, and what's the next lesson? Can anyone know what it is? We touched on it already about patience. I had written down, Krishna talks to him about spiritual development. Yeah, Glenda, do you want to? So in the um, spirit world, time sort of ceases to exist or it's very different, so we have all the time in the world to learn these lessons. Yes, he says that. But he also says that we have to expect for it to take time, doesn't he? That learning and growth is gradual, and we, it's almost like he's saying to us, we have to get used to there being a mystery, because there's always going to be mystery ahead of us. Yeah, yeah. Does anyone have anything to add to that? We'll go on to the next lesson. Lolly. Um, I just want a bit of clarity. He's saying something about everything has its mystery and each stage we have to solve it before we can actually eventually see God. Yeah. Um, so is that meaning that uh, each stage has a mystery is like the more we absorb uh, about the truths in our lives and we actually feel them, we get to see more? Yeah. Is, that, is that what he's referring to? Because I didn't quite understand the mystery at each stage. Well, if you think about it now, at the stage you're at in your development, can you, can you feel like not everything for you is certain or known, is it? Even a lot of... <laughs> is that an understatement? Yeah. <laughs> it is for me. <laughs> anyway. um, even th this little thing that I just drew up here, we've heard it, but do we know it? So there's a mystery, isn't there? I'm going to have to, and as I continue to grow, that mystery may no longer be mystery. I may know it as fact. But then there'll be more mystery, won't there? There'll be more things to learn. There's more discovery. Does that make sense? Yeah. And as I, as I learn more, then my world literally expands, doesn't it? If you think about five years ago, how you felt about the spirit world and how you feel now. What's it like, the difference? It's, it's massive, isn't it? And that's just in five years and we still haven't really known this lesson. Imagine when we do, how is it going to be? If we understand our beliefs now are making us blind, if our beliefs change, how much are we going to be able to see and know? But there'll still be mystery. There'll still be the next thing to learn and grow and... For a lot of us, I feel, because we are used to getting approval once we know, that feels pretty yuck. Like, what? I'm never going to know it. I'm never going to be, like, on top of everything. But I feel that a quality of humility is coming to love that place, coming to, to really acknowledge, yeah, there's more to learn, and just wanting to be in that space of always learning. I, most children depending on how they've been raised, don't have a sense of like, oh, I don't know, I don't know, I've got to know, I've got to know. Like a panic to know, they have more of a wonder to know, don't they? 
If you think about watching your kids as they, you know, just learning different things, they were like, wow, and why? 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 You know, you'd answer and they'd say, but why is that? And that's because they're, they're not like feeling like, you've got to tell me or I'm going to be bad. They're just like, it's so cool that, it, you know, there's a reason for everything. And a lot of us have lost that by the time we're adults because we feel like, man, when I didn't know something, I got humiliated or I, that's the only way I feel I have a sense of self if I know everything. And Kushner is telling us, Get used to it. <laughs> be patient with yourself. Enjoy the learning. There's going to be mystery. Um, so that's a big lesson from the chapter, isn't it? Yeah. Yep. Julie? And Mary, just to go back on what you're saying about children, children believe we doubt. Yes. And that's a big blockage, personally. Yeah. And why do you think we doubt, Juju? Um, because we've been let down many times and we've been ridiculed and we've been um, blamed and... Do you think that causes a doubt, though? What do those experiences cause us to have? Well, doubt in ourselves. Yes. A and, and, and our... I, our guess, I guess my feeling about doubt is we doubt because we don't want to experience fear. Oh, yeah. Mm. When we've been let down, there's grief in us. And that's... So there can be grief in us or a feeling of hopelessness. But doubt is this sense of, I don't really know. I, I don't know. Maybe it's wrong. Maybe it's wrong. You know, oh, well, I don't know. I don't know. And it's really a place of not wanting to just feel one, one or a number of emotions. And usually for myself, it's in fear. And it, I actually often prefer doubt than... And doubt feels pretty yuck, doesn't it? Like, it's like a blur place. There's nothing really <laughs> happening. It's like... Um, but I prefer the yuck of doubt and uncertainty to fear often. Because when I go out of doubt, it's like, oh, my gosh, I'm afraid this thing is true. Or I'm afraid that thing is true. Or if I believe that's true, then I have to feel the pain of this other thing. And so I'll just doubt it. If you think about it, in, the, in a lot of you guys trying to heal issues from your childhood, doubt is a preferable place, isn't it? I don't really know what happened. You know, I don't really know. But you know how you feel. You're just afraid to feel it. And so you doubt. You doubt whether this whole thing is right. Who's gotten to the place where they've gone, look, yeah, it's gotten so confronting, I just don't even know if anything about the human soul is right anymore. <laughs> you know, maybe it's all crap. I'm just going to doubt it all because it's getting scary in here. It's getting painful in here. So I'll just doubt and it helps me avoid the whole thing. Yeah. And Mary, I think as, as well, we want the proof. Where in the spirit world you... What does proof help us avoid? Our emotions, do you think? Yeah. Do you think? Fear. I doubt that. <laughs> yeah, fear. <laughs> Often we were... Okay. Show, but honestly, we can go, show me, paint me a picture, give me the experience, everything... And some people who've had that still choose doubt because they don't want to just feel. Yeah. Yeah. Lorraine? Um, about doubt, um, I thought that doubt, my own doubt, um, having feelings when I was younger and then having that nullified, does that not create doubt? Um, no, I still feel yeah. that doubt is the place you go to to avoid the pain of having your own experience nullified. Okay. Do you see the difference? So if I have an experience and then it, be, it becomes ridiculed or, like, reduced to nothing or, yep, you know, not given any worth, doubt comes in because... I don't want to feel the pain of that ridicule. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. If you think about it, say you're little Lorleen and there's a big person there and you go, guess what, this thing just happened. And they go, that's ridiculous. That's, that so didn't happen. And you're an idiot for even feeling that. Then how does little Lorleen feel? Crushed. Like, this is horrible. You know, oh, everything that I thought was real is not or whatever. And you feel dreadful. 
That's really what happens in that experience experience usually you might question as well like wow I thought that was real but I could have sworn that's real and you know but usually that happens because we're already wanting to avoid the pain of it feels horrible that what I just experienced is not valid now if you fast forward to growing up Lorleen in an interaction with me and if you you say to me Mary look I just had this experience. It was really amazing. And this thing and my guides and then this thing, other thing happened and it was amazing and I learned all this truth. Now, would you ever say that to me? I, if it happened, I might. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel often you, you come saying, look, God, I think this thing happened and I'm not really sure. Could you just give me some idea about whether this could have be potentially right. <laughs> yeah. And so that's, that's being in a place of doubt, isn't it? And what are you avoiding? That thing where I go, that's you come and go, this thing happened, and I go, that's ridiculous, you know? And it's not, it's not the truth being given to you, is it? It's the feeling that came to you when the big person said to you, that's ridiculous. They didn't say, hey, little Orlean, I'm... I don't really know. That's never happened to me. But this is what I know about science or, or whatever the thing was. So I don't know if that's... Could that have happened? It might have, but maybe... You know, that person is not ridiculing you. And it's the feeling of ridicule that we're wanting to, to avoid. Because you can come to me and go, this amazing thing happened. And I can say to you, oh, cool, <laughs> awesome, but have you thought about this thing and that thing? Now, that's not ridiculing you, is it? It might cause you to question about the experience, but that's not doubt either. When you're just questioning and reasoning logically and feeling, you're still in a process of learning and growth, aren't you? When you switch to doubt, you're avoiding that whole kit and caboodle. Yeah. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. Yeah. Graham? Would there be, uh, like, an opposite injury where, say, the mother says to the child, I believe everything you tell me. Yes. And the child says, oh, this happened and this happened, this happened, and the mother just goes, oh, yes, 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 yeah, wonderful, you know, and goes along with anything, even though, you know, like the one you said in the middle was, have you thought of this? Yeah. Seems like a more real way to go about it. More loving and connected, actually, yeah. isn't it? If I'm yeah. just accepting everything that someone's telling me and going, yeah, wow, 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 and completely checking my brain out of that situation and just giving them an emotion of almost like worship some mothers have of their kids, isn't it? And, or um, I've seen kids with disabilities or special gifts where parents are avoiding the pain of where the child is at and almost placing this kind of mystical, spiritualised knowledge onto the child and saying they're so wise and they're so, you know, as a way to avoid the the trauma of what's happening for them and for the child. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what kind of injury do you think that develops in a child? What does it open them up to even? Hmm. Not sure. Not sure? Do you want to pass back to Geraldine at the back? Uh, arrogance, and, and then they can't take criticism, or can't, can't accept that they might be wrong at any point. Yeah. And what else might it do to, um, in terms of spirit communication? What might happen, do you think? If you just have a, an imagine about it. If there's a little child, yeah, Karen? So it can make a child arrogant, and yes, what I experience is the truth for everyone. I agree. What else could it do? Well, I imagine there'd be a lot of spirits who'd be very happy to use that child as a voice piece to influence people. Yes, yeah. to give them experiences, to create little mousepiece mouse for piece. them. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I have seen that happen. And why is that damaging, do you think? Well, the child's not feeling his own feelings. Then. The sense of self for the child is not really being developed, is it? Because there's sort of this, this is a wonderful child, um, and this can happen with all kinds of kids. Um, this, is, this is an amazing, valued child who's special 
in every way, um, if that emotion is coming from the parent and they're willing to accept anything that comes from the child, then the child is not, as Geraldine pointed out, they're not learning, hey, my experience is not everyone's experience. <laughs> but also, they're then being like opened up to become like feeling special and being overcloaked and given special knowledge, and they can lose themselves really quickly with both injuries. Yeah, yeah, it's a good point, Graham. Mm. Okay, back to the chapter. So we talked about patience and learning with growth and mystery. The next lesson was the one we all had a big uh, with hiccup with last week. What was it about? Nobody even wants to talk about it. <laughs> Rochelle, yeah. I don't know if this is right, but the, the law of rapport and the sympathy, the addictions, yes. the spirits. Yes, yeah. So, because Fred's saying, like, what's going on with all this spirit communication? He just wants to know everything. And Kushner tells him in a paragraph just after the one about growth, he's saying that... One great law which governs and controls everything with us is also the means by which we may reach and save mankind. Now, what is the one great law? We've learnt this in other chapters. Ange? The law of rapport. No, the oh. one great law we learn oh. in other chapters. Oh, Kushner said there's design. one great law that governs everything in this spirit life. Law of design. No. No. Something beginning with L. Yeah, no, <laughs> Bob, yeah. Love. Yeah. But you're right, we are talking about the law of rapport and desire, guys. But the one great law is love. Yes, yes and I wanted to jump into a song like AJ, but I just wasn't confident enough. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, Bob. <laughs> Not today. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So the one great law is love. He's saying there's one great law. But then, so in knowing that, under that, he begins to explain some things about these different laws, the laws of rapport and sympathy. So in doing that, we know what about the laws of rapport and sympathy? That they're part of the law of love. Yes, that they're governed also by love. Yeah. Okay, so he says, sympathy, whether pure or impure, base or noble, holy or unholy, has a natural attraction for that which is like itself, and, it is pa and its power is not destroyed by the grave, as you have seen in the cause of our present mission, which is the following the woman, isn't it, who's been called back to the earth. So this is where I asked you guys to think a lot about what governs how we interact with spirits. And we talked about rapport, and sympathetic attraction. Now, for the purposes of this discussion, which we're going to come back to as we talk about your homework, I'm going to say rapport is what happens when, say, Graham and I share a desire to grow in love or we share a desire to learn about tractors, or we share a desire to learn about vegetable gardening. There's a rapport between us, and if all three of those are there, there's a really strong rapport, isn't there? Does that make sense to everyone? So what's like within us will draw us together, and often when we're talking about spirit communication between us here on Earth and people in the celestial realms, what's the thing we were always telling Paget? Pray more. We need you to get into the right condition. That was so we could develop rapport. So his heart was more open to God. He wanted more of these higher truths. Then we could give them to him. It makes sense, doesn't it? If the bottle's closed, it's very hard to get anything in. If we open ourselves up, then truth can pour into us, which is basically the teaching of humility, isn't it, that we talk about all of the time? Yeah, okay. So that's rapport. Sympathetic attraction. Now, we, we got a bit bamboozled here, didn't we? <laughs> Who feels like they got what we were talking about with sympathetic attraction? Kate? Um, it's when there's an openness in one person to give something and a desire in another to receive something and a willingness to 
engage an interaction like that. Yeah. So could you give us an example of something like that? Yeah. Um, somebody who... Um, so somebody who has a desire to avoid their fear yep. and somebody who is, has the potential to become ang angry, yep. there can be an attraction here around... Yeah, yeah, so so say I'm the sort of a, I should say probably a desire to avoid fear and a desire yes. to be pandered to or a desire f yeah. um, like a potential for ang for anger if um, if um, I'm not being pandered to if I'm yeah. not getting what I want. So could we say that person might desire power and control? So there's a, f a fearful person say and then a person who wants control, a feeling of power over others, sense of security, and they're willing to get angry if that doesn't happen. And so the person in fear would be likely, wouldn't they, to give lots of things to that person to, to avoid their anger. Some of us will even try to be their best buddies and think, we, we really like this person. This is who I want to have as my best friend when really the interaction that's happening is, I'm terrified of this person and I'll do anything to avoid them feeling displeasure about me because I can feel their potential rage. And so I'll just pander away. They'll think I'm awesome. And both of I get to avoid my fear, they get to feel powerful and in control, and we all get to avoid their anger. <laughs> so that's what we mean by sympathetic attraction. It's a broad brushstroke, but it's something that there was just a lot of resistance to that last week, which tells me you guys are quite afraid of understanding what kind of sympathetic attractions are happening in your life. Both, well, it's one law governs it all, so on earth and via the spirit world. Yeah, Lorleen? Oh, yep, and we'll come to Kate after that. Yeah. I just want to ask, uh, sympathetic attractions, are you saying equals rapport? Or is that and or? or? Oh, no, that's an and there. Yeah, so... So I'm, I'm sort of making the distinction. Obviously, um, I'm using rapport for when we have a like injury and I'm saying sympathy for when we have a, a compatible kind of opposite injury. Obviously, the sympathetic attraction creates a kind of rapport. But just for the purposes of discussing the different ways interactions happen, I've kind of separated the two out like that. Is that okay with everyone? Yeah. Just so that we can kind of understand where we're at in the discussion. Does that make sense to you, Lorleen? Yeah. Kate, you had something? Yeah, I guess a similar question just with about the terminology. So would you say that, um, that this rapport, the likeness and the sympathetic attraction, this is um, what uh, addiction is kind of... Uh, I'm just wondering about where addiction fits in, if it's sort of that these both can potential open up an addiction. Y yeah, so what's your feeling? Yeah, my feeling is that addictions with people would yep. be based on one of these two, two things being present. Yes, yep. I agree. What about loving relationships? Where can they occur in these two things? It's, it's have a go if you want, yeah. Um, oh, well, there can be a loving rapport. Yep. I'm not sure about a loving, sympathetic attraction, though. So. Does anyone feel... Can anyone think of an example of a loving, sympathetic attraction? Neil? If you just pass back, Kate, to Neil. Yeah. I know only too well. Um, <laughs> codependence. Codependence. Is it loving? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so no, it's not. No. Just, yeah, no. yeah. Oh, sorry. It, yeah. It's not. You know, so it's just... Um, Kate was saying fear, fear, and um, somebody who will acquiesce to the fear. Yes. And so it can't, we can't really form a loving relationship based on those things. And this was something I asked you guys to think about in your homework. Sherry gave us this awesome example of her and Steve where they both had the same belief, and that was women should be listened to. And so they had this huge relationship where she got to talk and he listened. <laughs> so <laughs> they definitely had a sympathetic attraction but was it really rapport? 
I suppose it's a report to the same idea, but it's not really a loving-based belief that's holding them together. It's, a, it's an error-based belief that's holding them together. Yep, uh, Lorleen, and then we'll come to Graham. Um, if I like to garden and my partner likes to cook or make salads or something, yeah. um, I don't like to cook so much. Is that unloving then? No, not necessarily. So that could be a sympathetic attraction that's... That's slowing, yeah. I was just going to ask about whether the relationship between a mother and child could be a sympathetic attraction because it wouldn't be rapport because they're not the same. They're not the same, yeah. So do you believe you can have a rapport-based relationship between parents and children? Say that again. Do you believe that you can have a rapport-based relationship between parents and children? Yes. Yeah, and how would that occur? If you both liked sport or something like that. Yeah, yeah. or even if you're, all of the family is based in some very um, loving-based values and belief systems, then the rapport, the, the attraction would be continued, wouldn't it, based on we want to grow, we want to you know, serve, we want to be honest with each other. That could create rapport. Now, you're talking about sympathetic attraction, between. I just thought of another example when yeah. Laureen yeah. mentioned hers. I just thought, well, um, I like cooking and in, I've had relationships with people where I've, that I've lived with in the past where one fellow that I used to live with, he hated cooking but he was more than happy to be washing up. Yeah. You know, so, so I just did all the cooking and he did all the washing up. Now, now It always it, seemed to me like that was a good relationship. Yes, but... <laughs> Can I put the challenge to you that if you never washed up and he never cooked, is that the way it was? Yeah. If, if, yeah. Then aren't you guys neglecting certain issues of love of yourself? Yeah, that's true. We're not challenging ourselves, are we? Yes. So it's only going to lead. Like the growth in that area is shut down because of the addictive relationship. So my theory is it's if you're in that much of a sympathetic attraction, it's not going to lead to growth in the end. So it might be good in some sense, but just if you, like, you don't take it too far, you know, you've still got to challenge yourself with respect to cooking occasionally or washing up occasionally. And this is where I feel things come back to your belief systems. If you believe, commonly in a relationship, be it a friendship or a partnership, that we both believe it's healthy to grow, we both believe it's unhealthy to be in addiction or that it's unhealthy to foster addiction in, or help the other person avoid, then we will naturally challenge the other person to say, hey, I've washed up for like three months now. It's time you had a go because this doesn't feel right. But if we don't have that belief system, which is really kind of the basis of a more healthy rapport, then we'll just happily sit in the addiction. And we might grow in other areas through other relationships, but in that area, we won't grow. Yeah. But going back to your first question, which was about the mother and the child, I believe that... That's the, that's the root of where our sympathetic uh, addictions and relationships start, in those dynamics of the family. So in, that's, as you know, this is where most of our errors, when we're small, come from our environment. And when we're in this relationship with our parents, if my mum's angry and I want to avoid fear, I'll do a lot to please mum. And then I'll go out into the world and all the women I come in contact with that I'm afraid of, then I'll... Now, it could be that Dad's angry, but Mum is not willing to pander to a man. She'll just condescend to the angry man. So I'll, I'll grow up thinking, I'm not afraid of men, just condescend to angry men. And there, but there is, again, a place for a sympathetic attraction to grow. It's one based not on a loving belief. Does that answer your question? Um. I'm, I was just exploring to see whether there can be loving, sympathetic attractions. Yeah. And uh, I'm still not sure. Yeah. I, my feeling is that not really, because we're not, we're not... I'm thinking as well as we're talking, but I can't think of an example where one person is willing to give something. It's not ethical. Do you know what I mean? I want, to, I want you to give me something I'm not willing to give you, but I'm giving you something else that you're not willing to give me, is usually what happens in a sympathetic attraction. So if it's not ethical, it can't be loving, can it? 
I don't know. <laughs> yeah. That's my that's my thinking about it, but we all have to feel about it for ourselves, yeah. If we just pass along to everyone. Um, I think there's one question there. So if someone's in a sympathetic attraction like Graham's talking about, and the question is, what happens if one person stops playing the game? Yes. What does happen? Well, what happens then is the other person's not getting their addictions met, and that's when it, when it shows up. And what happens to the attraction usually? It's gone. It's gone. And this is, remember Unless in your homework, I asked you to reflect on what are the belief systems that you've had commonly that have held re relationships together? Have they been error? Have they been loving? How's that relationship gone, you know? Because this is something really interesting to look at. And if we go back to Kate's question, who's, and she asked, where does addiction live mainly? Can it live in both? I do believe it can live in both, but let's think about this. Because I'm going to put to you that most relationships are based on sympathetic attraction. Because say I'm an angry woman. How, what, what, what's the nature of my friends going to be? If you want, yeah. um, people who will comply with my anger. People who will, yep. Yeah. And so they'll do everything while well, I'm one of those. I'll tap dance <laughs> so that no one's angry because I don't want to get into trouble for their anger and I don't want to feel their anger. So my friends would likely be people who please me. Yep. If we go back to Suzanne, do you agree, Suze? What, what do you feel? There's a lot going on for him, me here, so yes. I feel like I've, I'm in and out, losing the thread of it. Is it okay if I... I'll, I'll just go ahead and you tell me to shut up. I'm sure, sure. Right. I had so much trouble with this chapter. Yes. Every time I read it, I fell asleep. Yeah. Then I sat down to do the homework and I was completely perplexed because when I looked at common interests, they all looked to be lovely things. Yes. You know, they're all things that, that, that I love with all my heart, so... You know very well that we're very codependent. Yeah. And I have looked a lot at now, like this codependence thing. Saturday I sat down to do the homework. It was so bad that I just kept falling asleep at the table and ended up out in the barley pit fast asleep for hours. Wow. And then I kept crying about, I don't want our relationship to break up. Yeah. And I went into that for quite a long time. And then I got quite angry and said, no, it's not going to break up kind of thing. <laughs> I'm really, really like five-year-old and stompy about it. Yeah. And then the next day I woke up and I felt a lot better. But I kept looking at all of that and going, it's, we, where What's, am I with all yeah. this now? You know, what have I actually done? And I never, I was so far away from understanding the difference between rapport and sympathy. Yeah. And in this, I can see a way that I never understood before because I'm, we have so many ways that we're lovingly compatible. I get very confused and that's where the doubt comes in. And now I can see that what it is, you have to look for the sympathetic things and identify where they are and they're the things that you can work on. That's what you can heal, can't you? Yeah. If you are in addiction with someone, the yeah. sympathetic attraction, yeah. if you look to... To, this is the purpose of your homework. And the, the fact that you kept falling asleep is, I feel, about fear. Yeah, I, I really, yes. You, you got that, hey? Oh, yeah. yeah, completely. It's like, but and then, I... And then it took you into fear, didn't it? You yeah. had a big cry. I don't want to face this because what if we break up, really, yeah. is the feeling. Yeah. And then you kind of went, no, nah, I'm angry now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's enough fear for me. Yeah. <laughs> but you did feel better the next day, didn't you? Yeah, I did. And I think that's because you were just more humble to the process. You, when you were sleeping, yeah, yeah. this is no, I'm not being humble to this God, I'm avoiding. Mm -hmm. When you had the big cry, you face some fear, Suze. Right, okay. You face some fear of this is bringing up stuff that's very confronting for me. Yeah. And you, you had a cry about it. Now, you're always going to feel better after that because you've actually faced a part of yourself. Mm -hmm. It might not be resolved, but you feel like, ah, oh, I connected to what. It's horrible, isn't it, when we're in resistance and we just feel like I feel lethargic, I feel like I can't find any passion for anything, I want to sleep all the time. And every time I get to that place, I go, I'm terrified right now. There's something really big I don't want to face. And sometimes I just have the big cry of, God, I can't face it. I don't yeah. want to face it. It's too much. I'm terrified. And 
Ironically, that helps me move, not so ironically, logically, that helps me move through some of the fear. So I feel the exercise is showing to you heaps, hey. It is, yeah. Yeah. Provided I get it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I feel you're getting it. You're in the process of getting it. And you've hit on this beautiful thing that I was trying to highlight in in the homework, which is when you have rapport around loving beliefs, this is something that fosters your relationship. It helps love grow. If I believe that I'm as equally important as my partner in the relationship, not my fear is more important than him, if I believe he is as important as I am, which is one of God's truths, that is going to help foster love in our relationship, isn't it? Now, most of us don't even carry that belief. I don't have that belief. We believe when I'm afraid, that's when all bets are off. Then you can go, I don't care how you feel. (laughs) You know, you're important to me, your desires are important to me, until that point where I'm terrified and then I want it by my rules. Mm. Now, if we could all live by just that one truth that even when I'm afraid, you are still as important as me, then that's incredibly binding for a relationship. Mm. Even if you reach a point where you walk, you walk this path together, you realise, wow, we have so much in common in terms of these loving... And you and Raj have like amazing things that bring you into rapport. Mm-hmm. Desire to serve, desire to know God, desire, all of these other things. Then you have codependence. Then you... <laughs> yeah. And who in the room feels like they don't have codependence in their relationships? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> My hands are firmly down. <laughs> Although mine gets challenged quite a bit. <laughs> I go for co, it doesn't do dependence. <laughs> um, yep. And then I tantrum about that because everyone else gets it. But anyway. Um, <laughs> it's horrible. Wow. I'm ashamed of that actually. But anyway. Um, if you're right. If you work on the issues of codependence, the sympathetic attractions, yeah things will become more clear and more loving. And this goes for anyone in any relationship, even if at the end of all that they realise, hey, I'm not sexually attracted to you, we're not soulmates. There is still more love in that relationship than in the relationship that's in codependence. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Suze, for sharing. Yeah. If we go, Lorlene and Graham. Yeah. I'm just still trying to clarify this rapport and um, sympathetic attraction. So if I was to say um, sympathetic attraction doesn't mean a similar likes or something like that. It may be the beliefs that cause the... Um, do you know what I mean? Like Sympathetic attraction you're talking about now yeah. or rapport? Yeah, because... If I, if I like the, go back to the gardening, I like the gardening and someone else likes to, to cook the salad. Yep. But in gardening, that person learns uh, about gardening and I learn to cook. Yep. If I don't believe that he should just, or whoever, should do the, the cooking yep. and I do the gardening and that's the rule, right? That's a belief. Yep. Yep. But if it's only the belief, it's not the attraction of I like gardening and he likes cooking or whatever the situation is. It's the belief that is the actual Um, addiction, isn't it? That's what I'm trying to uh, sort out. Do you know what I mean? Um, I think so. Basically, the soul and our emotions cause every attraction. So when we get talking about gardening versus salad making, I believe our interest in gardening is governed by our soul and our emotions. It could be in harmony with love or in disharmony with love. I know a lot of gardeners who garden to avoid their life away and other people who love the earth and really want to be involved with the garden and give to the garden, all kinds of, they're fascinated by the garden. Now, one person is in addiction, the other person's in a state of love, is governed by their soul. Equally with cooking. Sometimes when I really want to avoid, I cook up a storm. It's fantastic. Well, I'm creative, it's really good, yeah, I'm in my passion. And at the end of the day, I haven't felt anything, but there's six cakes and I don't even eat cake, you know. (laughs) That's happened, or two cakes, not six, but that's happened more recently than I want to admit. Um, But then there's people who love to create and they feel connected with themselves when they're cooking and they're interested in food and they're passionate about it and all those things. Now, 
two examples, one in harmony with love, one in harmony with error. So that's, that's what's governing the attractions, the beliefs about those things. One belief, it's okay to avoid while I cook. The other belief, I'm in, I want to fill my soul and be connected, so I cook. So you're right, it's beliefs that draw us together. And like in the example of Steve and Sherry, sorry, Sherry, I keep coming back to it because it's one we had. I believe it's okay for women to talk, I believe men must listen. That's the belief that draws you together, which is why I asked you to think about your beliefs in your... And as Suzanne remi rightly reminded us, we talked about beliefs being emotional last week. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. No worries. If we go back to Moni, uh, we'll come to Graham while we're passing to Moni. Yeah. Um, an intellectual approach to rapport seems a little strange to me. Like, as an example, in our relationship with Jen, yeah. Jen has always tried to cultivate the things we have in common. And I think it's out of a desire for rapport, you know. And so is she, that true rapport? No, it's not. Because she, what's she, she doing in she's that She's sacrificing space? herself trying to like the things that I like. She's trying to generate rapport rather yeah, than allow it to be she's trying there. to generate rapport. Yep. Whereas from my perspective, like I just see our relationship is just loaded with codependency. Yeah. And it feels like the codependency is so in front of us that we, I can't see what we've got in common. I know there's something there because there's something that draws us together. Yeah. But... Um, it's like, until I can get rid of the codependency or we can get the codependency out of our relationship, we won't even be able to see the rapport. Absolutely. And some people, there isn't rapport. There is just codependence. Mm. That's, uh, who's been in a relationship like that? <laughs> and, and I've tried to go, oh, no, there's rapport because we both care about the same things. And, you know, five years down the track, I go, oh, I was just totally kidding myself. That man doesn't even care about the things I, that I care about, but I wanted him to because he was meeting my addiction so badly, so I told myself a good story about it. Yeah, well, that's where the fear comes up because fear of dealing with the codependency stuff because there's a fear that, oh, we'll deal with all this codependency and there'll be nothing left. Yes. Can you see why everyone was freaking out at a soul level last week? Because this is what... When we examine our relationships, be they with spirits or with each other... These are the things that we have to face. What is real here and what is my addiction? And it's true. For some of us in friendships, in partnerships, we could deal with all the addiction and go, actually, there's no rapport between us at all, you know? If we deal with it lovingly, we'll go, you're a great person, I wish you all the best, but I can't find any reason for us to stay together. And when you're talking about a partnership, this is where this, it just feels like the stakes are high. What if they don't, you know, they're, they're going to feel hurt or they're going to feel I'm horrible or I'm going to feel I'm horrible or I can't live without them. Uh, what would I do without a man or a woman or, you know, all these things. Yeah. But this is the path, isn't it? Facing fear, growing in love. Yeah. Moni? Um, just on that point... Um I feel like Alex and I often get to a point where we go, we're not soulmates today. Like we get through an addiction and it, it all turns to shit. And then we have to work on, on what is the love, like cultivating or, or feeling the love. Like we, we, get back, we get attracted back through working through, yeah, as time goes on. So one, one, is, one is removed and then something else, love grows in that place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, can, if you think about it, if, knowing what we all know intellectually about soulmates, two halves of the soul, yeah, in their pristine state, their passions and desires are very similar. They both love gardening and cooking, for example. You know, not one or the other. They both, they both want God. They both want to create houses or whatever it is. Now, we, we know from the teaching, even if it's just in our head, that when we are free in love, when we've cleared our injuries, the two halves of the soul will be unified in these desires. The rapport will be so strong, they're irresistible to us. So that's rapport. We, we both have passions and desires the same. Now, when we have codependence, we, we feel like some of us, who's had a relationship where you just think, 
I want that man or I want that woman like so bad and, you know, we've got to be in a relationship with them and it, you know, it goes on for years and then usually by two years, all of that is gone yeah. and we're like, mm. you know, you, relationships take work. You know, and that's when we start, you know, you've got to work at keeping the sexual attraction alive and you read the books and you do all the self-help and watch the, go to the seminar, all that stuff. And it's really just because the law of compensation has caught up with us. We are in a heavy addiction with this person and real life has dawned and it doesn't always feel that hot and heavy anymore. It just kind of feels blur. But, you know, the, the global idea... <laughs> The global idea is that that is normal, isn't it? Because most relationships are based on codependence. Now, some of it is extreme, and that's what they talk about in the self-help books. But some, it's lovely. It's gardening and cooking and cycling on the weekends. You know what I mean? Now, I'm not making a comment about your relationship. Or anything, but you know what I mean? And everyone goes, they're a healthy, fun-loving couple, and they've just sorted it out, you know? And, but really, it's codependence, you know? So when you start working through your injuries, if you're with your soulmate or not, when you, one of you breaks the codependence, it feels yuck. You're not even attracted to you anymore. Like, you know, we are not soulmates because that, you know, that sexual attraction is the hallmark of, of soulmates, isn't it? No. <laughs> not when you're not at one with God. Um, Anyway, what happens then, though, I think is what you're saying, is that if you both have a certain set of beliefs, like, I want to keep growing or I want to know God, then you work through the pain that not having that codependence met brings up and you can actually find yourself, oh, we actually feel closer than before. Exactly. Yeah. And that's pretty magic. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Go again. Yep. Could I just ask you a question on you? You asked a question about uh, rapport versus and um, the other one, the second one. Sympathy. Yep. Sympathy. Um, I just, in, in my experience, when this week when I was looking at rapport and um, at my beliefs, I found that say, for example, I have angry women who I have rapport with who believe that it's okay to be angry with a man, and I also believe it's okay to be angry with a man, and I want to control. Yep. And have power, and so do they. Yeah. But then also, there's a sympathetic injury that if I don't project anger, yes, then I'm attacked, and 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 I have to feel my fear to be in harmony with love. So it seems like maybe they're different spirits, but I feel like they're the same. That I can have rapport and sympathetic. With yes. The same. And this is where I was sort of starting to allude to before when I was talking about what draws us together with people. Because you're right, I feel this happens a lot. We have one belief in common with them. Yeah, I don't want to feel my pain about men, so I'm going to get angry. But for, in order for them to influence you into you, like using you as a vehicle for their rage, not yours now, you have to be afraid of them. And just on that, that's what I have started to feel. Like, I feel the anger coming through and it's like, wait a minute, I just breathe and feel myself. It's like, that's not even my anger. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I Which have is, believed that it's mine. Exactly, yeah. And for a lot of us, our, say in that example, we walk around going, I've oh, got this huge injury with men, I'm so angry at them, you know, that's the story we're telling. But when we deal with one injury and go, oh, I'm terrified of women, then it's like, oh, phew, I'm not even really that angry at men anymore. That's exactly right. Yes. And, 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 and that avoids all the injuries that I have with my mother because I'm constantly like, like what yes, Asian you've all said the men. whole time. Yes. And which is perfect, what they want me to believe. Exactly. It's all about men. It's all about men. I can avoid this huge fear of women and my mum. And it actually just... This is why it's so dangerous to tell the story of our injuries before we're feeling them. I say this to people a lot when they go, so this thing's happening. Do you think that this is because of this emotion in me? And I can think back and I can remember this thing in my childhood. And I go, just stop. Because from my experience... It's only when you start to feel that you go, oh, it's not really what I... That was an intellectual thing that I did there and my actual emotion is rooted in something else that I didn't even realise. And when we get caught up in telling the story about it, 
we're actually trying to comfort something inside of ourselves anyway, trying to avoid the fear of uncertainty of what is actually inside of me usually. We try to frame it all so that we know where we're going to have to go to next because we think that's going to help us avoid fear. And then we end up trying to go to this place that I'm crying about this, it's not helping, nothing's changing, my whole, like what I'm attracting isn't changing, my relationship isn't changing, but I know it's anger at men, you know, and we bash the thing a bit more and you don't get anywhere because in the end it was just all fear of women. And I just, so that, are you saying then that we can have rapport and um, sympathetic Sympathy. with, the same, with the same group? But then could I ask another question, another, yep. another uh, sort of rapport that I've had, like men who know. And so I hook into men who know because I, or, oh no, that, that makes sense. Like I have the sympathetic injury that I feel like I don't know. And you want a man who knows to help you feel safe and guided and protected and all of those things. And they're like, yeah, yeah. we'll help this helpless little woman. Sure. And we know. And often they don't know. They just have the feeling that they know. So that's not rapport because I don't actually believe I want to know. No, that's, that's sympathy. But yes, very often what's happening is a set of beliefs and the, the whole thing... This is why I said it was a broad brushstroke saying rapport, sympathy. I was just trying to help you guys understand the different ways attractions happen because it is based around beliefs essentially. So one belief you have is um, I... Uh, I, I feel justified at being angry with a man. And the other belief you have is, I should never confront angry women because I'm terrified. And so those two beliefs make a strong attraction. Yeah, yeah. Graham? I just thought of something that's a sympathetic attraction, at least it seems to be, that would have to be loving. Yeah, you've been uh, sitting there thinking, yeah. what, is, what is it? Yeah. Um, when the soul splits in two and you get a male and a female... Yes. Um, wouldn't that be a sympathetic attraction which, was lo which is loving? Yeah, but do you feel that... Well, do you feel that males and females are opposites or something? You just mean, like, because there's a penis and a vagina? Is it sympathetic? Well, not necessarily. Like, the soul can... Sp like, I know AJ has said that the soul doesn't necessarily split, that, that, that each half has exactly the same as what the other one has, that one can have what the other one lacks... You know, so they complement each other. Um, uh, okay. What and it I seems like the male and the female complement each other yeah, rather than... Sure, masculinity complements each other. But what I feel, though, is inside of the soul is the one personality. Now, sometimes in our injured state, one half of the soul expresses that personality in a more pure way than the other in certain areas. So, gardening, cooking. You know, one person grew up and there was no blocks to gardening and so they feel really happy to garden but they're really angry about cooking because of the issues with their mum or something. The other half of the soul grows up with the same passions, gardening and cooking inside of them but they are shut down towards the gardening because of some issue with their dad and, but they're really open to the cooking. It looks like they've got two separate passions that complement each other but my, I put to you they've got both passions one is more blocked to each one. So while you can have more masculinity and femininity, the personality itself doesn't, it can't be you get the happy part of the personality and I get the pensive part of the personality. It's the one personality. Does that make sense? As for saying it's like a sympathetic attraction, the male-female thing, I think it's kind of missing the point of what I'm trying to teach, which is about emotions that complement each other, was that, that um, f ha feed each other, if you like. Because in that situation, with the soulmates, it's actually a rapport-based attraction in its pure state. So you don't have to agree with me. I'm, I'm, I can sort of see what you mean. Like, it seems like it could be both rapport and a sympathetic attraction at the same time. Yeah, I'm saying I don't feel it's sympathetic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Does it, is that clear to everyone else? Do you kind of... Do you, yeah? Okay. If we pass back to Suzanne and over to Rochelle, is that on that, what we were just saying? No? Okay. Yeah. I don't know if I'm getting this, but I'd like to. Yes. And it seems to me that rapport is win-win 
and sympathetic is win sacrifice. Yes. In the sense of, of the two parts of the one soul. Uh, sorry, can you explain yeah. again? So rapport is win-win. Like neither side sacrifices anything in order to, in um, order to be fulfilled or to express themselves or be creative in the relationship. Whereas sympathetic is that one wins but the other one sacrifices something. Um, is that right? It's more like, 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 we have the same belief, like we have the same, we both want God. We both like heavy metal. We both like gardening. That's rapport. Yeah. It's the same. It's, I am like, we are both alike. So alike is probably a better way to put it. The belief is alike. When it's sympathetic, it's like I give something to you, you give something separate to me. And the rapport is based on the willingness to do that. And they're not the same things we're giving to each other. Does that make sense? I think that's what I was trying to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think so too. I just, the win bit, I was like, you don't always win with a rapport based attraction, it's not always good. Yeah, no, no, I'm still really... <laughs> it's just, it's like, if you think of it like science. Oft, remember earlier we talked about you can have addiction in rapport and in sympathy. Right, okay. Yes. But it's very, I believe the mo you can't have love in sympathy. You can only have love in rapport. Okay. Does that distinguish the two? So we, these alike beliefs can be loving and they will foster a strong, healthy relationship. If we both believe injecting heroin is good, then we're not going to have a good relationship. <laughs> but we will have rapport on that one issue. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. But this sympathy where I have to give something that I want to, in order to get something from you and it's not the same thing, that's where I said it, it's not ethical, it's like it's a barter system and it's only going to lead to sort of negativity in a relationship. Yep. Okay. If you pass back to Geraldine. So um, I'm just trying to get really clear on this. Um, and um, I'm remembering at the beginning when you asked, um, so what, does anyone remember what the law of rapport is? And Kate said it's... Um, when one person is willing to receive what the other one wants to give, that's actually sympathy. That's sympathy. Sympathy. Yes. So are they both different laws or would you call them the, both the same law and just sort of different aspects of... Or doesn't it matter? I don't think it really matters. I feel like... I just want you to grasp some principles about how attraction happens. I feel the law is really the law of rapport and sympathy. Yeah. You know, okay. it's the one thing that governs. And when mm. we talk about it, usually we talk about it in relation to spirit interactions, but it happens in our relationships as well. Mm. If you think about the law of attraction is the messenger of truth, and these things create attractions, don't they? Huge attractions. But the, if you think about the law of attraction as the thing that brings you truth, and this is the way that we interact, and they're all governed by love, and they do interact with each other. But I don't really want to go into that huge intellectual, you know, nitpickiness. I feel that if we can focus on our soul, and I feel like, Sue, some of the questions you're asking are good because it's helping you understand what's this emotionally feel like. That, that's where I'd like to, you know, focus. If we get all, like, intellectual, I feel there's a reason why we want to. It's to avoid the emotion of it. And that's the pothole we fell in last week. Yeah. Okay. So... Are we good with that lesson? Because I'll finish the lessons in the chapter, then we can come back to the homework, which I know will speak to a lot of this. Okay? All right. Okay, back to the chapter. Wow. Rewind. <laughs> Kushner, so did everyone, can you see um, there, he says that love links soul with soul and has power to bridge any gulf if it is only strong and true. 
So he's saying that this rapport will work if there is love, but he, and that's when it will bridge a gap and there will be more knowledge. He talks about the fact that why shouldn't we be able to give this knowledge between the realms? And love, it can only happen in a loving way, as you know, because when you're in sympathetic attraction with spirits, how much truth gets to enter the bargain? Nothing. <laughs> yeah, nothing. So he's saying if love is strong and true, we can bridge that gap. But he says... Um, yeah, and that was, the, that was the next lesson. It's logical that we may communicate between the realms. He's saying, he keeps bringing this back to logic. Of course we should be able to because it's loving. When there's more knowledge, it helps to ease pain. Unnecessary suffering, doesn't it? And so why wouldn't we have, it's, have communication in both directions? So he makes a strong argument in this chapter, doesn't he, for the fact that we should communicate between the realms. But what does he say we need to do? The next lesson. We talked about it a bit last week. He says, if, if people followed the simple teachings of Jesus, it would be possible for higher spirits to communicate with those on earth. And by that I mean, I feel that he's saying, in order for celestial communication to happen with people on earth, we must uphold the simple teachings of Jesus. And... What do you think he means by the simple teachings of Jesus? Anyone? Um, that we can grow in love towards God, whether we're here on earth or in the spirit world. Can... Yeah, and what's something that Jesus has been talking to you guys about a lot lately? Something beginning with E. <laughs> if you pass back to Deb. I'm not sure about E, but I thought it was the golden rule, do unto others as you'd have them do unto me. Yes, which is the ethics. Ethics, right. Exactly. Ethics and morality. <laughs> Things don't always add up in my mind. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> Things don't always add up in my mind. Yeah, the that's way all right. Yours or someone else's, yeah. I understand, but you, you got it. <laughs> that's what I meant. So I feel that he's saying if people were ethical and moral, if they practiced love for God and each other on the planet, then we could communicate all this truth. But because people don't and they hold on to beliefs that are not loving, then our hands are tied. And, and we see this through the book, don't we? And as the book goes on, yeah. Okay, so that was lesson number seven. And lesson number eight, what is the thing that Fred finally learns about the darkness that he's in? Why is it dark? Yvonne? It's reflecting the um, spirit condition of mankind on, on earth, that the darkness and the cold is um, showing a lack of our love. Yeah, he says, the amount and quality of light radiating from a man declares his real condition. And the degree of charity affects the, the temperature, the atmosphere. It's cold because there's not much charity. What do you guys feel about charity? What's that word convey? If you go back to Diana. I guess um, to me when I read it and felt about it, it was a, a generosity of spirit, uh, a desire to, um, to grow in love and... Um, and to care and for others, care. kindness, mm. compassion, all of these kinds of things are sort of conveyed in charity. So when that collectively is not here, it's cold and dark and all of those kinds of things. Yeah. Now, how do you feel about that last lesson, that statement, knowing that Fred's crossed the mist and it's all dark and we know that's because of the collective condition and the... What, what do you feel, Yvonne? Um, it's just another scary step in terms of coming closer to my true soul condition. Yeah, but um, it's, it's good that you put up your hand because what I feel coming from you when you convey it is self-punishment. It's this feeling like, oh, yep, I've been bad and I have to face it. Is that humility? 
when we impose a judgment upon ourselves about things, we avoid humility. Now, we might feel pain about the truth of it, but as soon as we go, yes, I am bad, we, it's, it's actually an avoidance of humility and we're actually trying to correct ourselves through punishment rather than through humility. Does that make sense? Mm. And I feel that amongst a few of you and I, sometimes I feel like it's one of the major blocks that we all have to humility, you know? Oh, just this, if we face this, it means judgment, you know, it means I'm bad and, and it just, everyone goes into this downward cycle instead of going, right, that's the truth. How do I feel about that? Why do I want to justify this state? Like, honestly, most of us, we go, yes, the, the soul condition, the collectively on the earth, it's dark. And we go, yep, that's bad. We're bad because of that. We should be more loving. And then emotionally inside of us, there's like, but it's too hard to do anything different. <laughs> you know? And that's really what happens for a lot of us. So we say it's bad, but we really think it, sh it can't be any other way. And that, it can't change if we do that. Yeah. Um, thanks, Mary. I've been sitting in that for a week. Yeah. I felt it in you, Vaughn, for a while, yeah. 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 So it, it, just the way to heal this is to say, or to f let yourself feel about why you prefer that state. And often it's a combination of a number of things. Something we've been taught to do in childhood, a way to avoid other action, lots of other things. Yeah. When, when we were talking before the group, we were talking about the, the benefits of hemp. And Igor is like the hemp encyclopedia. <laughs> he can tell you like what you can use it for. You can build it for a building and rope and I, I can't have forgotten all the things, but amazing things. And there was four of us standing around going, yeah, that's awesome, awesome. And as I started the group, I can't remember if, who it was. If, it might have been you, Igor. He said, yep, one day it'll happen. And I said, well, only if we act on it. You know, we, we can say things like, and like he says in this chapter, the sun of righteousness is coming. It doesn't have to be dark forever. But that's only going to happen if we all can face where we are without judgment, without justifying it, saying it's bad, but what else could it be? Because most of us carry that feeling. It takes us going, this situation has been going on for a while, <laughs> a long while now. How can I act to change this? It's going to require my humility, which is not avoiding any dark corner in my soul. But when I get to that dark corner, not beating myself about it, just going, why is this here? This is pain. How can I heal it? You know? Yeah. Okay. Good last lesson in the chapter, hey? Yeah. All right. Let's get to homework. Does anyone have any other questions about the chapter before we move on? Monique? Uh, just a, a question on chapter seven. Um, I mean, sorry, lesson seven. Lesson seven, yeah. So you said um, spirit communication, like increasing our spirit communication. I just have a question that um, sometimes I speak to my guides and I get lots of information and it's like, whoa, that's too easy. And, and, and I've... I have, I have a question, like, aren't I meant to be going to God always? And it sort of, like, seems like a cheating way that I, if I get... Yeah. It's, it's, it's a question it's I It's a have. good question, yeah. yeah. Does anyone else have the same question? Yeah. Yeah. I've had that feeling before. But let's, let's talk about God, your guides. Are your guides males or females, Monique? Um, I have... Both, a, a few yep. different ones, yep, male and female. Okay, Monique's guides and there's Monique. So, how do you communicate with God and receive things from God? I pray, I have a desire and, and I feel God. I, yep, you have a desire. Yep. And what do, what's the conditions required in your soul? I, I really want to know something. I really want to change. I... So desire, desire. yeah. Desire. Um, I, want, I want the truth, so... Desire for truth. And how do you usually obtain desire for truth in a soul sense? Oof. Interesting. Um, I, I, 
interesting writing upside down. Oh, when I want to be humble to accept the truth. Humility, yep. So, realistically, it's not just a little bit of humility, is it? Oh, there's also like the faith that the answer will faith. come. Yep. And, and that I can change when I receive the truth? Or? Yes. So you have faith, humility and a desire, a strong, heartfelt desire. Mm-hmm. And how does God then communicate with you? Um, sometimes I feel the answer. Like, it, it just comes, like, not spirits, like, telling me, like, you know, darker spirits, but I, I just know. Yeah. What happens for you emotionally? I have to be open to receiving. Yep. I'm going to say something here about how God communicates with us. It's through his feelings and his dominant feeling for you is love. So truth comes from God via his love. So if you're not receiving divine love in the moment you receive that answer, I put to you, you're receiving it from your guides. Because, because I, have, I have this question. Okay, that makes sense. Because I know that, um, like in the soul team, they say, you know, and, and AJ said that unless we are emotional, we're not receiving divine love. Yeah. And I, and I haven't been emotional. Yeah. So why do you think you have guides then? Yeah, if we go to someone else, if we go to Deirdre up the front. Because we have to um, take steps to get to God. And so we need almost like stepping stones. Well, I know for myself, I need a lot of stepping stone to get there. So. so it's almost a provision of God's love, isn't it? That we would have people to guide us. Guide us to these qualities of faith, humility, sincere desire... To the point when we can, where we can obtain it directly from yeah. God. Yeah. Does that make sense? Now these guys, if they're celestial, that's going to be their main focus, is helping you with these qualities so that you can obtain this direct relationship and communication with God. But be aware that when you're in this direct communication with God, it's going to be overwhelming all the time. And most of us are afraid of that and we don't want to launch into that. And so our guides are there reminding us, if they're celestial, reminding us of those truths and how to gain those truths, gain those qualities rather. Um, And sometimes, Mon, you know how you were saying, I don't receive it like people talking to me. It's like a feeling. If these guys are celestial, they're going to love to communicate with you via feelings. That's their preferred mode. Because they are feeling beings. That language is like the backstop. Okay, we've got to engage language with this girl today because she's pretty blocked emotionally. Let's go for it. Yeah? Does that make sense? Yeah. Ange? Just, it's with Deirdre here. So then we... I mean, you're saying that the celestials or, or the um, divine love guides will... will prefer to use f- their feelings or and, and our feelings. That if, if we are feeling, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that way we get to feel it as a truth, you know, in our bodies, emotionally. So they can't help us feel a truth, but they can, you know, like when AJ is speaking to you yeah. and he is full of passion and feeling, yeah. sometimes you find yourself crying. Yeah. It's sort of the, the feeling yes. hits yes. your feelings. Yes. Now, sometimes that opens you yes. and the truth can enter yes. you a little. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But it's not him putting the truth into you. No, no, it's, yeah. it's, it's our openness, um, our openness to our own feel or to feel um, that allows that process, their feeling to impact us. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so they, that is love as well. Yes. Um, I don't really know what my question is. That's all right. It's a good point because they are giving you love. And what is the love they're giving us? Well, it's not 
It's not divine love. It's not divine love. No. It's a natural love. Yeah. But what is the quality of their natural love going to be like if they're celestial? Pretty nice. Pretty good. <laughs> it's pretty purified. Yeah. Because when we, and this is one of the things that is so awesome about God and receiving divine love, is that if we, if we want God's love and we want God's love to enter us and essentially purify us, mm. clean out all the yuck in there, then our natural love is going to be much stronger than the natural love we just develop without God. Yeah. 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 Because it's more pure and also we have a mo- morality towards God, it, yeah. not just ethics. Yeah. We have a feeling towards God and God's laws yeah. that we're not willing to break, which will impact on how we love other people as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If we go to Nina over there and we can come forward to Graham here. Yep. Um, I think you just answered a question that I've really been pondering on for some time and that is when we receive God's love, we will be overwhelmed. Yes. And there was a part of me going, well, really, that's not very practical because I can't go around in a totally overwhelmed, bawling my eyes out state. Yeah. But I just, somehow the light just went on. It overwhelms us and we're crying because it's healing and injury so that when we're at one, we'll be able to receive that love and it won't be... It will still be overwhelming, like in the sense that it's, it's expanding our soul. It's, it's, it's a, an experience that will occupy every part of us, our senses. If you think about when you're overwhelmed, you can't really like, think of other things, can you? You can't really entertain other like thought processes and you can't really even un- entertain other feelings, really, can you? If I'm really overwhelmingly sad, that's what I am at that moment. If I'm being overwhelmed by God's love and I'm at one with God, it's okay because my mind isn't really dictating interactions anymore anyway. My soul is. And I'm going to be overwhelmingly loving with everyone. <laughs> in my, I'll still be able to do things, but I'm... I'm in a state of overwhelm and growing. But somehow that's a more functional place than <laughs> removing an error? Because I've really been struggling You're with this You're a bit one. worried about function. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Control. Control. <laughs> that's the thing. When we're overwhelmed, we can't control anything anymore. Like, overwhelm is the opposite of control, isn't it? Yeah. And most of us are just terrified of overwhelm. And yet, when we allow it in moments, we go, that is such a relief. It's so awesome. And really, I don't know how it's going to look when we're all wandering around, feeling overwhelmed all the time. But I get the sense there'll be a lot more peace on the planet. (laughs) Thank you, Mary. No worries. Graham? Um, Could the... One big difference between a relationship with God and a relationship with our guides be that our guides can dim themselves in their brightness so that they're only coming from somewhere a little bit above us, somewhere that's reachable for us, you know? Yeah. Whereas God doesn't do that. Yeah, just like Deidre said, they're like, they're like a bit of a stepping stone. And I do feel it's a very loving provision that God has made that once people, you know, that everyone's assigned a guide. As soon as they want one, there's a guide there for them. Even when they're on the natural love path, they're there for them. And the only prerequisite is that they're in a higher condition of love than us and therefore can teach us things about love, which will help us grow. So it's easier for us to communicate with our guides because we have more rapport with them because they bring themselves into a state where they're closer to us, whereas God is way up there. It's harder to have the rapport with God. Yes, exactly. It's, if you think about um, humility and a desire for God's truth, it's actually about developing rapport with God, isn't it? I want God's belief on this, not my own. And God goes, okay, here you go. But that's a pretty humble space. That means giving up a lot of control and saying, I don't know how I'm going to look on the other side of this change, but that's okay because I really want God's truth. And when that enters us, then we have more rapport with God. So you could say we're, as we grow towards at one moment, we're just developing more and more rapport with God. So as we develop our rapport with our guides, that also has the side effect of bringing us closer and more able to have rapport with God. Yes, if they are celestial guides. Yeah, yeah, yep. 
Good point. Deb, and over here, Christiana. Uh, I hope it's okay to go forward in the questions, um, the homework questions, or did you want to stay on track? Uh, Christiana, is yours about this? Yes, yeah, think. so if we just stay with this till we're done. Um, most of the time, I actually, well, 100% of the time, I talk to God. And everything I um, want to know and whatever, I direct it to God. I have very little desire or um, interaction with my guides because I, there's a particular block or fear there in regards to my discernment about who I'm talking to. Who you're to. talking to. Yeah. And this is a lot of the fear that a lot of us have, isn't it? Yeah. 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 So, And I feel really sad about that times because I know my brothers and sisters are sitting there waiting to have a... to be you know, have the relationship with me yeah. that I would love to have and, yeah. and whatever. And I just hope at some stage that I'll be able to develop that trust and discernment and be able to open that with them. But for now, I'm just, I'm just focusing on God and everything is directed to God. And um, I feel obviously the, the guides are, uh, are talking to me anyway, regardless of whether I'm... Because what do you think happens when we direct something at God... But we're not quite in the right condition of these things. But there's other people here appointed by God who really love us and really want to help us develop these qualities. And they're actually assigned by God. They're going to be able to, because we're actually asking more. We, remember I said the bottle closed, nothing can enter. When we ask something with a sincere heart, we create an opening. So our guides will be able to give us more truth. Um, even as Mon said, when she asks God, sometimes she receives it. Um, because these guys are really acting, they, they have rapport with God, they know God's truth and they can respond to sincerity. In, further to your comment though, they, have, they can have more rapport with you when you do want to have a relationship with them. So it's only going to get better, that communication, when you do open your heart and decide to take a risk, it feels like a risk, doesn't it, of getting something wrong. Yeah. Who else has that feeling with their guides? I don't know who you are, so I'm not talking to anyone. <laughs> Lots of you, hey? Can you see how it's like a kid learning to swim? If you never get in the swimming pool, you are never going to learn the difference between breaststroke and freestyle. You just not. But when you get in the pool, it might get messy. You might try to freestyle when you should be breaststroking. You might like mix up your stroke. That's, it's going to happen. And when a kid's learning to swim, we go, it's natural. It's okay. It's a new thing for you. It's as lo this is where as long as we have some basic beliefs inside of us that will keep us wanting truth and God, it's hard to go wrong. It's when we want addiction more and we want sympathetic attraction more, then it's going to get messy. <laughs> but God's designed all these laws to help us figure out, oh, things are a bit messy now. Maybe I need to reassess what's going on. Yeah. So can I encourage all of you, like, try things out, you know, because it can't grow. We can't grow unless we experiment. Yeah. If we go back to Geraldine. Uh, Mary, at the expense of labouring this point, um, I'm a little bit confused because I'm wondering how does our relationship with God come into this? And I heard AJ in his talk the other day say, look, it's your relationship with God that is the important thing. Don't worry about your relationship with your guides. Just focus on your relationship with God. So, you know, I've... Did you hear me say if you have celestial guides, every advice they'll be giving you is to help you strengthen your relationship with God? Yeah, I understand that. Um, but like as in, and I feel that I do very much get answers from my guides. Yeah. Um, but I always address God. I don't address my guides. Yeah. And so. as I was saying, if you do address God, that's fine. But just don't kid yourself. This is where it's dangerous. When you get the answers and you're not feeling God's love, that it's God. Because that doesn't help your relationship with God. This is where focusing on... AJ's right. Focus on your relationship with God. But understand what a real relationship is. And also, why would you discount the help that's being given to you from a higher source? Sorry, I rubbed out my picture. Um, if it's going to help you grow in that relationship. So, so I, I agree, primary focus, God. 
but all these are, we have all these um, this help around us. This is what Krishna says so many times. We're all here, and Fred's like, I want to help, you know. So don't discount the things that come to you in that pursuit. I agree that if you just go, that's it, I'm developing my relationship with my guides. If you do have celestial guides, they're soon going to lose interest and you'll attract other spirits. If you just focus on mediumship without a relationship with God, it's, got, it's not going to lead you to God. So that's what he's saying to you. So a bit of both, like addressing, like, because I've also heard AJ say that, um, you know, you'll develop a better relationship with your guides if you communicate with them and ask them about themselves and you, you have a desire to, to know them know as, people. Them as yeah. people. Yeah. 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 So I don't really feel it's a bit of both. I feel it's the same endeavour. Can you see that? I think I just said that actually. Okay. If you, if you are focusing on a relationship with God and God has given you other gifts, which he has, our complete natural environment is all a gift from God to help us grow towards God. Um, our relationship with guides is all a gift from God to help us grow towards God. If we have this relationship as our primary focus, we will, we will welcome the gifts that are given to us in order to grow that relationship. So to me, it's the one thing. Okay, yeah. thank you. All right, now I think we need to head to the homework questions because we're going to run out of time. Is that okay with everyone? Yeah. It's okay because I get to say, remember? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Deb, did you want to talk about the homework questions? Yep. Um, the, uh, there was two things I just had in my mind. It's... Um, trying to figure out if it's, it's, it's appropriate. The, the thing that I want to talk about was the, um, the, the overwhelm. The reason I'm not seeing spirit... Well, actually, I have seen them in the past mm -hmm. and hear them is because I feel like I've got so much of my own stuff going on, I really can't handle anybody else's. Um, and yet they're there anyway, you know? Yeah. So does this... Who else has that kind of belief sometimes? I can't do mediumship because, man, I've got my own boat that's travelling fully loaded, yeah. Do, do you think that disengaging our mediumship helps with that? No, why not? Lily? Um, it helps us avoid the pain, again, the, avoid the yeah. emotions. Yeah, it like actually helps us. We're saying, I'm too overwhelmed, I can't do mediumship. The truth is, I'm not overwhelmed and I don't want to be by doing mediumship. <laughs> It, that's that's exactly right. Now, when I when I'm talking about that, I'm not talking about doing mediumship for other people or doing it as a service. I mean, disengaging our mediumship sense is about avoiding overwhelm and fear and overwhelm. <laughs> yeah, it could be overwhelmed by love as well. I I disengage my mediumship a lot because I'm afraid of the grief that the love that my guides give me triggers. So, yeah, I feel like you're letting yourself get away with something there, Deb. Okay, so let's talk about this. Did you have something else to say, Lily? I thought you had your hand up, yeah. Um, sorry? It was Barb's hand. Oh, it was Barb's hand, yeah. Go, Barb. <laughs> I was just going to say, though, I think for me it helps me um, um, stay in self-reliance as well. What's that? Um, just what we were just talking about with Deb there. Avoiding uh, yeah, mediumship? Yeah. Yes, avoiding mediumship um, because mediumship is also um, God's gift to us as, as a, a tool to get to God and, yeah. and I understand and accept that. And so me not wanting to um, develop that area and not develop a relationship with my guides is also um, staying in self-reliance, yeah. a desire to stay in self-reliance and, yeah, yeah. and a, a, willing, a desire not to want to let go of that um, control. Control, exactly. This is a big thing that I've been coming up against lately where it's like, here I am, little me, I feel little. Here's a crossroads. In one direction, which is where I want to go, it's like growth on my terms. 
I'd like to set the pace, thank you. I'll deal with this when I'd like. And, uh, you know, you can grow that way. It just might take a long time. Instead of it being gradual, it would be very slow. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, and I tell myself, no, this is the gradual way. But it's really very slow. And then there's growth. God's way. <laughs> And that's where I become God-reliant. I step. This is self-reliance and this is where I go, actually, God, you know what I'm ready for better than me. So I'll just be open to whatever's, whatever comes along. I won't shut parts of myself down in order to have more control because this is the part where I want control. You're exactly right, Barb. And this is the overwhelm path. And lately I feel like I'm right here going, I'll have a tantrum about that, thank you. I know this is the right way, but I don't like it because it's really scary. And I want to go this way, but do you think it's working out for me? And you know the truth is, I'm actually not moving very far from this point. Because I, because I'm, I know what the right way is and I'm just in rebellion about it. Yeah. That's becoming um, one of the major focuses of my prayers at the moment. That yeah. One, because it's too. a big one. Yes. Pray it, preach it, let's do it. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Who else? I, one of the homework questions was to feel about what fears you have around spirits and spirit communication, wasn't it? Yeah. Who, who came upon things that surprised them when they did that exercise? Things they didn't realise they had inside of them? Jennifer, if you go back. Thanks, Bob. Um, <clears throat> I realised that I have a belief that if I keep my head down and my eyes are straight <laughs> and don't bother with the spirits, yep. that, that I'm somehow safer. Yeah. And yep. it comes from the idea of walking down a city street yes. and seeing, you know, a corner of my eye, see a pack of hoodlums sitting there just waiting for something to, you know, cause trouble with. Yep. And, and it's been my experience that if I keep my eyes straight, my focus ahead, that they generally don't mess with me. Yeah. And so I've assumed that that was the case with spirits, and I can see how that has really restricted myself. Yeah. And what do you think? Because this idea, we talked, didn't we, briefly, ignorance is bliss, but it's, oh, I can't spell ignorance. Ian? Ian? Ignorance, that's it. <laughs> Eagle. There's, there's an N missing. Oh, Ignore. <laughs> yep. I just had a total blank because I was thinking about the next thing I wanted to say. Anyway, ignore ants. We all, like a lot of us, believe ignorance is safe or safety. Hey, if I don't know, it can't hurt me. And what have we learned? Who has learned that that doesn't really work? Because if you, even if you think about that in terms of what's inside of your soul, what I, don't, what I haven't wanted to feel or know about myself has driven my whole life <laughs> into some pretty painful experiences. And it's, but it's something we go back to again and again and again. Hey, it's a big false belief. If I don't know, it can't hurt me. If I don't know, it's not there. If I don't know, I can tell myself I'm a better person. If I don't know, I, can't, I can avoid the fear of the spirit world. When actually, like, knowledge is so empowering. So empowering. And this is, this is something that I feel we all need to learn about spirit communication. Um, I realise that by keeping, by being ignorant, yeah. um, I'm completely disregarding one of God's most loving laws, which is the law of attraction. I mean, yes. I'm attracting these groups of spirits around me, but I'm not allowing myself to engage with that law. Exactly. His messenger of truth is bringing me not only you guys, but a whole wing of other people. And not all of them are nasty. <laughs> Some of them are really nice and some of them have stories that they can tell me that I can learn about myself from. There is so much, hey. Yeah, so I'm going to say that knowledge leads us to more safety. But it's something that we forget too easily, yeah. Alan? On a similar note with belief systems, I believe that 
it was a gift that people were born with. So if I I more focus on what gifts that I already knew I had than yeah. a gift that I lacked in. Yeah. So the new age sort of bombard you about that, that, you know, and, and Christianity, there's a lot of belief that um, don't communicate to the spirit world because it's full of evil spirits. Yes. So just communicate with God. Yeah. Uh, or Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> and we know what happened there. But, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I'm getting it now when I was writing some stuff down on that subject, I feel that uh, uh, belief systems have actually crafted my life and it's lacked more uh, openness to the spirit world communicating to me because yeah. thinking that if I don't have the gift, then I'll go and pay somebody to gift it to me who yes. says they do have the gift. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe we need to add to this knowledge idea. It's not only like more safety, but it's... It's more, what is that thing that you're describing? Like, uh, there's more potential for me to discover, isn't there? There's knowledge... Of lack of awareness about new truths. The lack of, the belief that I, that, that is not a gift of mine made me blind to what is, what I can actually sense, yep. didn't yes. it? Yes. Yeah. So knowledge leads me to um, safety, it leads me to, or... A, or more complete safety, we can say, it leads me to... Because if you think about this safety idea even, if I, if I understand a spirit can only harm me when I have a sympathetic injury, then, wow, I can be safe pretty quickly. I just have to heal that injury. Mm. Yeah. So knowledge leads to safety. It leads to growth. And, like, and it, I suppose from what you're saying, it's like exploring new potentials about yourself, isn't it? Mm. Yep. Mm. Okay, yeah, that's a good point. Luli? Thanks, Alan. Um, <clears throat> I've just got a question about the safety bit. Yes. Because um, I was going down that line of reasoning myself about get rid of the codependent addictions and then the, you will get less harm. Yes. Then I was thinking about AJ getting, you know, like a million spirits attacking him the whole time. Yeah. And that doesn't seem so safe. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was like, well, that's not so appealing. So well, let's give it up. Who wants exactly, this anyway? Yeah. 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 <laughs> but when you see AJ, does he look like a man like raked over the coals by a million spirits? Yeah. No. How's the only way those spirits are affecting him? How, how, is, how are they affecting him now? Yeah. Well, how, how can they have an impact on him? While he still has the emotion in him of, mm. you know, not wanting to be attacked. Yeah. And he, I mean, he does have emotions in him that still allow spirits to cause him, like, pain. But he's also well aware that the more he heals that, the less that will be. There's also another important issue here. He is one voice on a planet speaking about love and truth and practising it. One voice. So there's a million spirits really upset about that. Now, his sincere desire is to actually help those spirits most of the time. And all of us here, sitting here with mediumship that we're, we're like in a love-hate relationship with, um, could be assisting these spirits, couldn't we? And that would reduce their numbers. So it's really not an issue of, if I grow in love, that's it. I'll be attacked by a million spirits. That's not a logical conclusion. There's one man on earth practicing and preaching love and truth and he's being attacked by a million spirits. Is that going to be the case for everyone who grows to the same development? No way. It's just that he's first. And he's undertaking this massive endeavor that hopefully we want to join him on, which hopefully would change the entire landscape of the spirit world and the condition of so many spirits in so much pain. So it's not logical for us to say, that's it. <laughs> I'm not growing and I'm not even, you know, I'm not changing these belief systems because then I will be attacked. What is that belief based in? Oh, more fear. Fear yeah. that I don't want to face. Yeah. yeah. Because when we have a relationship with God, we can be attacked a lot and it not affect us. Not to the same degree as a person who has got no relationship with God. You can see that, can't you? You can, you can even, can any of you even reflect on that? Like partly in your lives with the growth that you have made? Like things that seemed 
impossible three years ago. I can, for myself, things that I thought I could never survive, it would just be the worst thing in the world. Now I go, oh, well, I still feel a bit sad about that, but it is nothing like it was, you know? Yeah. So let's not, let's not use fear-based logic. This is a belief that keeps us blind. <laughs> yeah. Lizzie? And if we pass forward to Deidre, just here. I wondered how I could help spirits, and I didn't know how, because there just seems so many of them. Yes. And then I'm discovering it's, um, it's coming up with my own emotions and my own process of when I'm going through something. Yeah. And I was transcribing about reincarnation, and logically and intellectually I got, oh, yeah, you know, it's a belief, which I had in reincarnation. Yeah. And then when I really got it on a soul level, what it really, truly means... I was just, I just couldn't stop crying. Yep. And I felt, how can I help? And that's now what I'm endeavouring to do, is whenever I you know, get that moment or that chance, is to actually talk to spirits who still have that belief in reincarnation. Yeah, yeah. To stop these little babies you know, being born, either overcloaked or heavily influenced with spirits. Yeah. So it was sort of answered to me fairly quickly, and, well, you know, there's so many, and so many different aspects of different injuries that spirits are in as well, how, how, can, how can any of us help them? Yeah. So that's how it worked for me. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Yeah, because each of us is unique, hey, in our pure state and in our injured state, and that's going to create rapport, and we can utilise that rapport to assist people and ourselves, as Jen pointed out. Yeah. Yeah. Deirdre? When I undertook that exercise, one of the things I realised, it just hit home, was how afraid I am of my just my own emotions. Like, I could speak to anyone, do anything, if I just wasn't afraid of my own emotional reaction yeah. to their fear, their anger. They could throw whatever they want at me, but um, I, don't know, I don't know if I'm more afraid of love or I'm more afraid of harm. Yeah. I think I'm more afraid of love. <laughs> Cause of, harm. Because Cause, why? Because will... love is the most powerful trigger, so it just goes... Whoo, bring up all, all your emotions, yeah. yeah. Which is so beautiful, isn't it? Isn't it beautiful that God wants to heal us with love? Because he's so into efficiency, hey. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be the quickest way. And um, I, often, I often feel about this desire I have to heal people with love and through positive laws of attraction, you know? Like um, Eloisa down in Kyabra, <laughs> made me a pair of shoes and it just melted me that a woman would be so kind. She did, she measured my feet, she did a number of, you know, they're, they're my favourite colour, they're just, it's so much a gift for me. It's got nothing to do with her, she just wanted to give something to me and that, you know, that's so healing from an injury where I feel like women can't love me, you know. Now I could have a hundred attractions where that's reflected to me through women being unkind but one woman being so kind is just so oh, moving and I often have this feeling of this vision for I want to walk through the world and be that person for everyone you know how powerful will that be yeah I often feel that if we're all just were kind to one another we'd be at one with God within a year <laughs> <laughs> well we'd have to be humble wouldn't humble. we Humble and kind. Just as you said, yeah. if you weren't afraid of your own emotions, we'd just grow so quickly, yeah. wouldn't we? Because God's given us all the other material, like all the attraction, all of the wonder. All, it's all there if we would just be willing to feel. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk a little bit. I know we're running out of time. Um, just a few things about the other questions. Are you happy to keep going for five or ten more minutes? Yep. Okay. So we asked about, just going, Luli kindly sent me these again. <laughs> okay. Ask my guides, uh, common beliefs with people in our lives, friendships or partnerships, what are they? Who came up with some common beliefs that surprised them? Just quickly. Yeah, if we go back to Sandra. I was just surprised with all of them because I felt... I've healed all of them. <laughs> and as soon as I started writing them, I was like, oh, my God, codependence, like, just need, 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 demand, demand, demand. Yeah. So 
So just what, the usual ones like safety, yeah. look after me, pender to everything that I want. Just basically everything that I thought I conquered, I've just realised once, you know, was able to open up my eyes. Yeah. And it was just very confronting. So a lot about keeping you safe and having the yeah. belief that you should be kept safe. Who else found that one? <laughs> Yvonne, you had another one? Yeah, Mary, because um, I'm not in a relationship, I was actually looking at a situation I've had with spirit and spirit attack. Yep. So it's really helpful. Um, and, uh, and I realised a false belief that I had, and probably, probably with the other party as well, that's driven my life, and that is that um, if I do what the man wants or what I think the man wants, they'll give me approval. Mm -hmm. And that's driven my entire life and it was driving a reaction, interaction with this spirit. So what's the belief that you have? It's actually, you said, if I do what the man wants, he'll give me approval. Yeah. So the belief is, actually it's more than that. I must, I must do what the man, man wants. wants. That's the only way I'll get approval. Yeah. That's it's the just belief. it's so wrong. It's, just not, it's never going to happen. But they probably had that belief too. That if the wife did what they wanted, they'd give approval. Yeah. So it was probably. So why do you think ways. it's never going to happen? Because it's happened. Um, it wasn't a loving relationship. When you say it's happened, well, you said it's it was, never going to happen. Oh, happens okay. all the time. <laughs> well, well, um, I was never going to get approval that way. I don't no, believe. I think you have a lot. Oh, okay. You've gotten a lot of approval by doing what men want. <sighs> That's why you do it. Yeah. <laughs> That's why you keep doing yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> but what's the feeling you have about it? That's what I'm Now asking. I feel it's yuck. Like, you feel uh, it's yuck? Yes. And it's not love and it's not truthful to them. Um, so there's nothing that's loving about it, either for me or for them. Yeah. So it made me realise how I've spent my whole life um, firstly allowing, believing that truth, allowing myself to be treated really unlovingly. So there's a lot of lack of self-love in yeah. that. And, um, you know, often we do these kinds of things in order to avoid having to love ourselves. Mm. I don't want to take care of myself, so I'll just give some feelings to someone and they'll look after me. And mm. helps us avoid a lot of sadness we have about looking after ourselves. Yeah. So I think facing that addiction in the last couple of weeks, I think that's why I'm really in this quagmire at the moment of really facing um, my loneliness and, and being unloved. Yeah, um, yeah. It, it's been very helpful. It's good, hey? Big blind spot. Mm -hmm. All right. Who found... Um, who could look back on some past relationships or their current relationship and talk about the error-based beliefs and the common physical things that brought them together? Who could see that really strongly in their relationship? Yeah? Do you, do you dream or something? Oh, it's kind of interesting that, like, the common physical activities centred a lot around eating. And eating, yeah. eating. <laughs> the first boyfriend, I've only really had three, yeah. so the first one, KFC, was the favourite. <laughs> <laughs> like, and... Um, uh, so, it's, it's okay, Deidre. You know, I've been a vegetarian. I was raised a vegetarian. I'm really thankful for that. I'm not ashamed. But there were years in my 20s where I ate chicken... And I ate KFC after I'd been to the nightclub and that was the thing we would get, the KFC, so... Oh, yeah, yeah. it was oh, cheap yuck. and yummy and I did it. Um, oh, it makes me want to throw up now, but yeah. <laughs> the second one was sex. Mm -hmm. So eating and then sex. Yep. So a lot of avoiding on everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or, or watching a TV or movie, so not a lot of feeling. Yeah. So just, it was activity-based, <laughs> activity-based to avoid feeling anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who else could see a relationship where they could see they were brought together really strongly by this specific interest, like, yeah, Karen? That's all I could see with me and my husband. We had a lot of interests in common. Yeah, like hiking and nature and things like that. And, and, and our profession. That medicine, yeah. That excited yep. us both. Yeah. 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 So you kind of had this way of relating that, oh, I don't know your husband, I didn't know your husband, but a lot of people in these kinds of relationships have commonalities that they can just 
relate to each other. They understand the hardships, say, of being a doctor so, and the culture inherent in that profession. So you can talk about that. And then you have a common thing that you love to do together. And so you do that together and you feel closer together. Well, I'm ashamed to admit that I actually chose him cold-bloodedly because he had all those things that yeah. I wanted yeah. that matched me. Yeah. So. Yeah. So you were the one woman on earth who had the checklist and she ticked them and she got the guy. Like, wow. Yeah, yeah. I'm afraid so. Yeah. Did you feel there was any loving-based beliefs in your relationship? That was the next question. I know he loved me and I know that I've never um, been game to open myself to loving somebody to the point where I would be devastated if they left me. If they left, yeah. Mm. But did you see any beliefs that you both had that were actually loving beliefs about life or living or each other that actually helped you remain married? I think it's hard to know because I didn't try the opposite, but I think we remained married because I was so good at making his life very comfortable. Um, I, yeah, there was that. <laughs> So, yeah, so that's still not the question I was asking. I was asking about a rapport-based belief, so something you both believed that was loving that held you together. Well, wouldn't that be the, the common beliefs in our career and in the outdoors that we had? Yeah, although remember when we talked earlier, we talked about interests being driven by soul-based things. So I couldn't say that your interest in the outdoors was loving without knowing what drove both of you emotionally towards that interest. It could have been an unloving addiction. It might have been loving. Do you see the difference? Um, I think I can, but I, th I cannot see anything other than my... Like, it's from my earliest childhood I've wanted to be out there, you know, and he was the same, so that's all I can... Yeah, so say. maybe that was loving for both of you, but again, I can't really say because it, it, it's not really the belief, it's an activity. Yeah. Did anyone else find a loving belief that they'd help? Oh, you want to ask a question about that, Yvonne? I was just going to give another example. I actually did, a, did um, this exercise based on my relationship with women, yep. and I've only had one or two close friends. So. Yeah. Um, and what I realised, the things that um, held us together were, again, like Deirdre was saying, an interest in food yeah. and family, yeah. um, which was activity-based. But there was also, um, if I'm honest about it, a common, a shared interest about us being better than men. So there was a lot of commiseration and a looking to blame the man and how yep. bad the man is. Yep. Um, um, sorry, so still not love-based beliefs yet? No, but there was... But there's also a love-based belief in the relationship about caring for each other, and we've always done that. Yep. So, yes, there was the common interests, but there was a love-based belief, so I feel, we've always looked out for each other. Yeah, so having... What is the belief? Um, I, I don't know. It, it's a sister thing that... Um, and this is where I'm like... You've got to be careful on this one as well. Yeah. If the sisterhood is... Because yes. you talked about the one about we're better than men. Yes. I'll look out for you because I'm the one who... Can, me. Yeah, we'll look after each other and we'll keep those men right out of our yeah, hearts so. and lives. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay, who else, who else happened upon a love-based belief? If we go, yep, Lizzie and across to Renee here. Yep. Um, I wasn't here last week, but just feeling into it now, John and I met through the love of healing and truth. Yep. What do you mean, Lizzie? Um, well, before I met him, I was a spiritual seeker, yep. seeker of truth. Yep. And John was chiropractic and I was Reiki and we just loved healing and, and that aspect of helping people on another level to know more about themselves. Yep. And, so um, you both still carry this, this feeling. Yeah. yeah. So that's like a rapport. Is there a belief in your relationship about each other you feel that's love-based that keeps you together? That's putting you very much on the spot, I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, look, there are times when we thought, no, that's it, had enough, yeah. particularly being on this path. 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> this path is the... Yes. <laughs> Gee, you should it's talk really to the media, moment. Lizzie. <laughs> That's right. We are the death of all relationships. <laughs> It's just been more confronting. I mean, yes, we I have been mean. confronted <laughs> deeply before as well. A couple of times we've tried to split up and it just hasn't happened. Just something's always come to make us be together. Um, and I deeply know, we both know deeply, because we're both on separate journeys at the moment, mm -hmm. but we deeply know we do have a deep love and respect of each other. So you respect each other as individuals mm. with their, that you can have your, you know, you can work through things be on your own journey and you still want to respect the yeah. other person yes. yeah I agree that's a love-based belief mm. yeah cool Renee did you have one yes um, I'm not quite sure if this is the more the more I feel into it, it might not be necessarily love-based but it's we both have a, a desire to break family patterns that's for us that's, that's quite strong for both of us like the so you want to you want to become your own people, free of what your family has said you should become. Yes. Yes, I agree. That's a love based belief. Mm. Yeah. Oh, good. That's yeah. good. <laughs> I mean, I felt I did, but I just was looking at it again, thinking that could be still error in that as well. So. Well, if there's anger driving your belief, but I feel that if you're sincere about that belief, both of you, you will deal with the anger in, inherent in it anyway. Yes. Yeah. And also we, also we also feel like we do have a desire to grow in love, but that drops off and tithers and goes and then comes back. And yeah. so like that underneath is, does drive us a lot. Yes, yeah. Yeah, okay. If we go back to Monique. I really struggled with this question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I feel like just lately I've um, developed a belief that... Um, my partner's soft and sensitive and, and a caring man uh -huh. <laughs> rather than all men are hard. So, um, so sometimes that belief overrides some spirit influence when, when I just, I, I can feel him rather than hear what, what they say he's like. Yep. Yeah. So you've developed a belief inside of yourself that it's more of a desire to see the soul of your soulmate. E exactly. Yes. And, and, yeah. and um, I desire... Desire to know him and experience who he really is. Now, that is a really sturdy love based belief that's going to serve you in your relationship. And if he has the same belief and desire, he, he sets the example. Like, he, he let, like, he showed me that it's possible that all, oh, yeah. Yeah. So, that's a belief in, when held in sincerity that is going to help a relationship grow in love a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Nice one. Okay. Last, last question because I know we need to go. Um, the last question was, ask my guides to show me areas in my life now where beliefs are keeping me blind to truth. Who had some success with that? Karen? The one that bounced up for me was that I believe that children are not as important as adults. Yeah. And that blinds me to all the things they can show me and the wisdom that they have. Yeah, that's an awesome thing to, to come up with. Did everyone understand what Karen said? No. Um, it was, do you want to say it again? That my belief is that children are less important than adults and that blinds me to what they have to offer yeah. to teach me. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty awesome, hey? Anyone else come up with Rochelle? Um, I'm blind, yeah, I'm still believing with termination that I had when I was 18, I, I'm not a murderer, you know, this is the blind, because I didn't do it physically. Yeah. So uh, these women have been really stopping me from seeing the truth. Yeah. Yeah, so the feeling that I didn't end a life because I didn't actually perform the abortion. Yeah, yeah. and Even because of my beliefs and the beliefs they gave me at the time that it wasn't a real... Being, it wasn't yes. a live thing, that it wasn't yep. real. Yeah, also powerful truth to be shown. Yeah. Anyone else? Suzanne? And who over the, had their hand up over here? No one? Sandra? Yeah. Yep. Um, I had a few along similar lines, but um, that I was not responsible for every single choice, belief, and action in my life. And, and that my unloving actions could be justified by circumstances. Yeah, so they're false beliefs that you were shown, yeah. yeah. 
pretty big ones, yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Suzanne. And we'll go to Sandra last and then we should finish. I had an opposite to Karen, actually. What I realised, um, when I'm realising it's very confronting at the moment, is that children are actually, in my family, it was like the child gets everything. So I'm realising how much demand I have, how much I want to be that child all the time and how everything was done for me and I don't want to step into act for myself and I don't want to take responsibility for anything because, yeah. you know, that yeah. it's pretty... <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Awesome, you guys. That's some great truths to to be shown. To yeah, I sometimes I really just practice this, asking to be shown what I what I want to be blind to. It can be really powerful. So yeah, thank you all. Can I just make a reminder to please be conscious of your speaking into the microphone? There's a few times today. It's just I feel. There's an issue of love. If if you're not being conscious of how well other people can can hear you, instead of modifying your behaviour, ask why. Why don't you care? <laughs> what expectational belief do you have about it not being important or not wanting to be heard or whatever it is, or not wanting to respect the or wanting to honour your fear more than respect the group process or whatever it is. If you can ask yourself about that, because yeah, I. I just feel it's not my job to always keep reminding about that. Um, and there nearly has to be a point where I say, that's it, like we need to draw some lines about, I've given you the opportunity and it's not being taken, that kind of thing. So, yeah. But thank you for a, a really interesting discussion today. And I will see you next week for chapter 13. Have a good week, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>